every manufacturer produces a low, light bike with some well-trained horses. But if all you want is a boring pile of metal that won't kill newbies, go look in the cutlery drawer. KTM's RC390 is specced like a race bike. The Kawasaki KLX250 can crush black diamond enduro tracks. And Suzuki's TU250X is a gilded shard of what motorcycling once was. There's still the threat of the car driver. If you're gonna learn to love this expensive, dangerous pastime, the smartest choice is to buy something stupid fun. No primal reaction one way or the other, then always take the dual sport. These are the easiest to learn on, thinnest, lightest, it's the closest thing to a bicycle, which is the baseline most beginners start with. Plus, you can practice off-road. This is what the limit of grip feels like. This brake balance leans the rear in, and this peg balance keeps it upright. The dirt lets me learn technique at 10 kilometers an hour. Everything happens sooner, slower, and safer. Would you rather take your precious bike for a short tumble here or a long slide here? That is why the wildest riders are born in the dirt. So options. The CRF250L is cheap at 5,800 bucks, but it's a pot-bellied pig, hanging its 322 pounds just 10 inches off the ground. And the WR250R is lighter and higher at 295 pounds and 11.8 inches of ground clearance. But that extra height comes at the cost of a topsy-turvy, dippy-toe, 36.6 inch seat height, and beginners hate that shit. So, we arrive at our KLX250, a nearly as light 304 pounds and nearly as high 11.2 inch clearance, but the seat and price are down in Honda territory. Only 35 inches and $5,800. Take mine now. The result is simplest to ride, yet thoroughly thrashable. It helps that this frame is stolen straight from the 1990s KLX 300, giving our dual sport the backbone of a legendary trail bomber. Of course, it's not all old tech, but mostly it is. The only thing that changed on this bike since 2014 is the carburetor. Considering that it no longer exists, I'd say that's a pretty big change. No clogged jets, no choky cold starts, no maintenance. And to anyone new, we refer to these bikes as fuel infected, and the only downside is that there's no peacock to squeeze some reserve out of the tank. Horsepower is irrelevant. This whisper quiet engine will move as fast as you can move it. Pro riders would pin themselves near the red line where one finds horses in heat, but only pros are capable of exhausting them. Now we also ordered the camouflage colorway. It's about here. Kawasaki went to such stealthy lengths, blacking out the rims, swing arm, engine, frame, even the forks. It's just too bad that when I go riding in traffic or hunting areas or way out in search and rescue territory or anywhere, I'd rather be visible. Unfortunately, predictably, there's a lime green one. KTM's RC390 is the most powerful beginner bike. Her Majesty the Queen sets 0.26 horsepower per kilogram as the maximum you can stick under an A2 license. So KTM went and shoved 44 horsepower in this 168 kilo bike for a royal surprise, 0.26 horses per kilo on the bloody dot. The top speed for someone 
exactly my size on a mostly flat road around sea level at, oh, what is it today? 25 degrees Celsius is 177 kilometers an hour, allegedly. Firepower aside, this is also the most agile option. By a twisty country mile, its seat is higher at 32 inches and change, the reach to the clip-ons is more tucked, and the contortionist foot pegs are more rear set. The RC390 feels like perching on a falcon. Every other small sport bike feels like sitting in the pigeon. Just look at the chassis. This rake is a degree steeper than the competition, making the wheelbase an inch shorter. It's pocket rocket science 101. Smaller is flickier. But the fastest feature is not how this bike is shaped, it's how it's decorated. Mood lighting flickers with RPM so racers know when to shift. This is hung on sublime WP forks, a premium part that could be fitted to the RC8 Superbike. KTM spec'd adjustable levers that click outward to compensate for brake fade mid-race, flowing into steel lines down to a Herculean 320mm disc. The calipers have twice the pistons of the competition, and are not made by Brembo, but by Bray. Still heaps of stopping power, hence the fancy Bosch ABS unit. I'm all for learning to brake the old-fashioned way, but with this much bite, it's nice to have computer help. Besides, you can always turn it off when you feel ready to play with lockups. Yep. KTM's extravagant obsession with race prepping this machine left ABS switchable. Of course you won't inadvertently slide the rear on downshifts because they also splurged for an assisted slipper clutch. Whether you're slamming shifts in a race or flubbing shifts in rider's ed, it smoothens an unsettled rear tire. Added benefit is the super light pull. Racers use one finger for precision, beginners can use two without tiring. So the RC390 is decked with track tech, and even if you never race it, it feels fast. The angry single cylinder is jumpy at low revs and dashing up high, pure gasoline, compared to the competitor's watery twins. Oh, sorry. Just mentioning them makes me sleepy. One sheep, two sheep, three sheep, snore. <sighs> Meanwhile, KTM hid the taillight in the cowl and the cowl in the pillion seat so it doesn't look like a rolling motor vehicle regulation. The view is racy from the cockpit too, although you'll be cursing this competition-sized thimble every 175 kilometers when the fuel light comes on. Son of a To be honest, the range should be even lower. And KTM tunes their fuel mixture stupidly lean from the factory. It's the only way to get the napalm of motorcycles past emission control. But neutering a bike makes it run hot and bothered, so you'll want to stick a fuel controller on here right away to feed more gas and stop your legs from melting. I also recommend buying an RC390 new or cheap because reliability sucks and you will be back for repairs. Even better would be to buy it new and cheap, which is possible, because India has been churning out units since 2014. Many dealers are still sitting on new old stock. Maybe you don't care about going fast or off-road. You just want and motorcycle. Witness the best kept secret in motorcycling. Suzuki's are the most over-engineered of all the makes I've ridden, wrecked, and rebuilt. Their TU250X is particularly special. Designed in the 1990s before the invention of cost cutting, and for all the decades, they never moved production away from Japan. This craftsmanship is unparalleled in a $4,000 motorcycle. The chrome-plated wheels, headlight, taillight, mirrors, and speedo could slot into Harley-Davidson's wishbook. 
and they'd cost more than the entire motorcycle if they did. Speaking of status symbols, it looks like a Triumph Bonneville that someone shrunk in the dryer. Which is probably why they stuck 7 8 scale sex symbol Zac Efron on one for the Baywatch movie. So yeah, it's hot. Our TU-250 is clever too, it even has a riddle for you. How does a motorcycle, with 15 gentle horses up top, move with the meaty conviction of 100 bulls at low speed? Most engines rely on piston movement to suck in air, so you end up with crappy airflow when the engine turns slow, and better stoichiometry at high RPM. A skilled rider will know to work the gearbox up here in the power band, but for beginners this is a difficult mountain to climb. You get lost in low power and stall, or your shaky wrist jerks you into wet underwear territory. So Suzuki introduced a second throttle valve. This narrows the intake diameter to increase airflow at low cylinder speed. And the best part is that the computer controls it. And whatever us pieces of meat do with our throttle doesn't matter. The ECU works on its own to keep power production steady. A meatier bottom end, a more linear curve, ultimately a motorcycle that feels stronger, it requires less skill to ride. How Suzuki manages to offer this bike for this money, that's no mystery. They cut clever corners. Like using a drum brake at the rear, who cares when you're only stopping 326 pounds, eh? The twin springers are equally ancient. You may never drag a knee on such knuckle-dragging technology, but is that such a bad thing? I've been wanting to feature this bike since day one because it's an honestly delightful motorcycle. If I had to put every person in the world on one machine, this is it. And man, well, the world would be a better place for it.